Bible is full of stories that we all know and love. But how well do we know them? The answer might surprise you. The Bible you thought you knew is going to dive deep into the exquisite details of the biblical stories that make them fascinating and transforming. In this week's podcast, we will treat a story at least as strange as the one involving Balaam, the subject of the last three podcasts. In this instance, though, there is no talking ass. The episode I have in mind features King Saul toward the end of his tragic life when he was desperate to hear from God. This account is found in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Though Saul was still Israel's king, David had long since been anointed to be eventually Saul's successor. The backdrop for this story is a confrontation between the Philistines and the Israelites. Complicating this brewing battle, David had abandoned Saul and presumably Israel and allied himself to Achish, a Philistine king. That's in verse 1 of chapter 28. Because David was accompanied by a group of soldiers, he was valuable in any military setting. Achish knew this and insisted that in the coming battle with Israel, David and his men would be expected to fight for the Philistines and against Israel. David agreed to this arrangement, though it was fraught with harmful political consequences. How could David end up being Israel's king when he had aided and abetted the Philistines in a direct confrontation? This political dilemma may have concerned Achish as well. Perhaps for that reason, the Philistine king made David his bodyguard for life. That way, Achish could keep an eye on David in case the Israelites' loyalty to the Philistines wavered. That's in verse 2 of chapter 28. After this brief introduction, the chapter turns its attention to Saul. The narrator begins this new section by reminding us that Samuel had died. When that happened, Israel mourned the prophet's passing, and buried him in Ramah, Samuel's hometown. The narrator wants to remind us of something else crucial to this story, namely that King Saul had expelled any mediums or wizards from Israel. That's in verse 3. This latter royal act requires a little explanation. According to Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 31, chapter 20, verses 6 and 27, and Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 10 through 11, the activities in which mediums, wizards, and the like were involved, the, the, uh, the activities in which mediums, wizards, and the like were involved were strictly forbidden. According to the Leviticus text, engaging in such activity even merited death. A biblical text that has been tragically appealed to when people, mostly women, have been accused of witchcraft. Apparently, being a wizard or medium in biblical times was thought to be part of black arts or the occult, that is, another way of appealing to the divine world or at least something beyond normal human experience. In any case, it was considered very un-Israelite activity. For that reason, Saul had forbidden such practices in Israel. The narrator makes sure that we know that. When Saul gathered his forces and arrayed them against the Philistine army, either the size or ferocity or both of the Philistine military machine scared the Israelite king to death. That's in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 28. This was not the natural fear that any soldier would normally experience prior to a battle. Instead, Saul 
trembled greatly. Clearly, he was not ready for this campaign. Given his fear, Saul wanted to communicate with God. So, he inquired of the Lord. In this instance, inquired is a technical term that denotes formal efforts to contact the divine. Unfortunately for Saul, God did not answer in any of the usual ways. Saul had no revelatory dreams, got nowhere with urim, a sanctified use of of dice to indicate God's will, and heard from no prophets. God was silent, dead silent, in this time of Saul's need. That's in verse 6. But Saul did not give up in his effort to hear from God. Instead, he decided to consult with a medium. Saul's servants knew that there was a female medium who lived in Endor. Of course, this meant that Saul's efforts to expel Israel's wizards and mediums had not been entirely successful. That was a stroke of luck for Saul. He had to contact God, even if he was reduced to make use of this dubious practice. Since he was the one who had ordered the expulsion of mediums and wizards, Saul could hardly go marching to Endor to seek this woman out without raising suspicion. If there was indeed a medium practicing there, she would have been putting her own life in jeopardy if the king discovered her. To avoid being recognized, Saul disguised himself. That's in verse 8. He then went, accompanied by two of his men, to the medium at night. Coming at night meant that Saul himself was taking no chances. He was disguised, it was dark, and therefore he had a chance of not being recognized. Once he was in the woman's presence, he asked her to, quote, divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you, end of quote. Saul seems to have been quite conversant with the methods that a medium might use, which was curious since he had gone to the effort to get rid of these practices in Israel. Regardless, Saul wants the woman to use whatever means she had at her disposal so that he could contact someone. Of course, he was asking to communicate with the dead. I told you that the story was strange. But the woman smelled a rat. She pointed out to the disguised man that King Saul had seen to it that Israel was rid of mediums and wizards. This meant that the man with whom she was speaking was putting her life at risk, for if it became known that she had conjured up a spirit she could suffer the death penalty. That's in verse 9. In response, Saul did his level best to assure the woman that she would not be punished for doing this. He even swore to this by invoking the Lord's name. That's in verse 10. Evidently, she took Saul's assurance to heart and then asked whom the king wanted her to quote-unquote bring up from the netherworld. Saul had a ready answer. He wanted her to bring up Samuel. Just like that, Samuel appeared from the grave. When the woman saw Samuel, she immediately discerned that the person who had asked for him had been none other than King Saul. She demanded to know why the king had deceived her. She must have thought that the king did this to expose her illegal and illicit occult practices. That's in verse 13. But Saul Saul told her not to be afraid. He was not in the least interested in implicating or punishing her. In fact, he had depended on her skills so that he could communicate with Samuel. To Saul, the prophet Samuel 
was the only pipeline he had to God. Having settled the woman down a bit, Saul asked her, what was she seeing? She responded by indicating that she saw a God coming out of the earth. What did she mean by a God? Does that refer to Samuel's shade or ghost? Did she simply simply see some form that she could only identify as a god? Was she in fact surprised by what she saw? Plus, exactly what does a god look like? No answers to these questions are forthcoming. Saul had similar questions to the ones popping up in our own minds. He wanted to know what Samuel's appearance looked like. She noted that Samuel emerged as an old man wearing a robe. The reference to Samuel's age is hardly remarkable. Way back in 1 Samuel 8, his advanced age and presumed imminent death was what prompted the people to ask him to appoint a king. The robe is a little more interesting, however. This is the same garment, ma'il in Hebrew, that Samuel's mother, Hannah, had brought him when he was training under the priest Eli. That's in verse 19 of chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. Even though Samuel was studying to be a priest, his mother's outfitting him with a robe adumbrated the fact that he was soon to become a prophet, which happens in 1 Samuel 3. Eventually, Samuel turned in his ephod, a vestment appropriate to a priest, for a robe, a vestment appropriate to a prophet. In any case, the medium at Endor described Saul, Samuel, I'm sorry, described Samuel as an old man wearing a robe. When she mentioned this, Saul knew that she had conjured up none other than Samuel. Saul Saul bowed and paid his respects to the newly retrieved prophet. That's in verse 14. Samuel minces no words, though, demanding to know why he had been disturbed and brought up. Verse 15. He was in no mood for a chat. Saul tells Samuel about his situation, namely that he is at war with the Philistines and that God will not communicate with him through any of the usual means, such as prophets or dreams. The king goes on to say that he had no choice but to try and contact Samuel. That's in verse 15. Saul's request was really quite simple. He needed for Samuel to tell him what to do. Samuel, however, remains unmoved. Since the Lord has turned away from Saul and even become an enemy, what should he, namely Samuel, do to rectify that situation? That's in verse 16. Samuel adds that what has happened is precisely what he had said previously, namely that the kingship has been taken out of your hand, that is a reference to Saul, and given to your neighbor, namely David. That's in verse 17. This is due to the fact that you refuse to carry out God's wrath against Amalek. That story is in 1 Samuel 15. If that were not enough, the Lord is not finished with these acts of judgment. Indeed, Israel will soon lose its battle with the Philistines because God has willed it. Not only that, Tomorrow you, Saul, will be with me after the battle. The chilling implication is unmistakable. Saul has only one day to live. The next day he will join Samuel in the world of the dead. That's in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 28. This terrible news that Samuel gave proved to be overwhelming to Saul. He fell at once to the ground, seized with fear. The fact that he had not eaten anything at all that day did not help. Poor Saul was depleted, 
he had not an ounce of strength left. That's in verse 20. Even the medium took pity on Saul when she saw how the king had reacted. She reminded him that she had taken a risk to meet his request. Nevertheless, she now wanted to give the king something to eat. That's in verse 22. But Saul had no appetite, so he refused her offer. That's in verse 23. But the king's servants sided with the woman in encouraging Saul to eat. At last, Saul relented. He got up from the ground and sat on a bed while the woman prepared food. She did not merely provide a snack. She pulled out all the stops. She fed Saul like a king. She killed a fatted calf, baked bread, and put the feast in front of Saul and his servants. Everyone ate in verse 25. After this lavish meal, everyone left that night. That means Saul and his two servants. In a sense... This was Saul's last supper. Just as Samuel's shade predicted, Saul would die the next day when he fought against the Philistines. He would join Samuel in the grave. That account is narrated in 1 Samuel chapter 31. What shall we say about this story involving the medium of Endor? Are we to suspend our belief that when one is dead, one is dead? Does this story give credence to the belief that communication with the dead is possible? Curiously, even some very modern people entertain that possibility. Does this story demonstrate that the black arts, occult practices have some validity? What is the source of the medium's power? What form did Samuel take? He has been dead for some time, surely decomposing from the moment he drew his last breath. Yet, he was amazingly recognizable in this episode, even though he is identified as a god. The story skips completely over the question, what exactly does a god look like? This line of questioning runs into all sorts of dead ends, the bad pun notwithstanding. The story may say a little something about the netherworld as it is depicted in the Old Testament. For the most part, when Old Testament characters die, they enter a shadowy realm where they are, are, are by all means dead but at the same time oddly not exactly immobile or lacking in consciousness. This realm is often called by the Hebrew word Sheol. Though sometimes translated as hell, that has all the wrong connotations. When people think of the word hell, usually they have in mind a place where those who have been damned are to be found. If Someone avoids hell, they are presumably in heaven, the opposite place, a place where saved souls enjoy paradise. Sheol is not hell in that sense. In the Old Testament, there is no developed idea of an afterlife that is divided between places suitable for the unrighteous and righteous, respectively. All other things being equal, everyone goes to Sheol once dead. That is simply the place where the dead reside, so to speak. In post-Old Testament times, ideas involving differing places in the afterlife, some for the wicked and some for the good, begins to develop. Later on, the New Testament will reflect this evolution of thought. But that is not the situation we encounter in the Old Testament. The point of view reflected in 1 Samuel 28 is that a medium has the power to conjure up someone who has died, can speak to this person, can recognize him or her, even though the description is ambiguous, a god. This story is what one of my professors in college would call a truth 
story rather than a true story. This meant that its points are to be taken seriously, even though the factual nature of the episode may be questioned. In that vein, what might we conclude about this story? What is the truth in this episode? Surely the central point of the narrative is that God is silent when Saul needs to hear from the deity. In one sense, this is consistent with the larger narrative in that God had said via Samuel that the deity would not listen would not listen when called on if Israel persists in demanding a king like all the other nations. That's in 1 Samuel 8, and of course the people did persist, and that's how Saul ended up being king, even though God was the one who chose Saul. In addition, God's silence in this instance is part of the punishment being applied to Saul for his failure to complete the mission against the Amalekites. Again, that's in 1 Samuel 15. Of course, this flies in the face of common belief that God is always ready and willing to listen to human pleas, even, perhaps especially, those coming from sinners. Perhaps there is a sense in which God always listens and is anxious always to communicate with human beings, But there are many places in the Bible with divine silence or even divine inaction being emphasized. Think, for example, of the very first line of the 22nd Psalm, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's silence or even inaction may not always be a sign of punishment or judgment, but its reality can hardly be dismissed. We cannot even dismiss this as a merely human perception, meaning that God listens or is around regardless of whether we are aware of that or not. That may be a comforting theological idea, but is hardly assuring to the one who believes that God is not listening or not acting. 1 Samuel 28 is such a story. In the end, of course, God does speak, howbeit through Samuel. But it is scarcely good news. Samuel doubles down by affirming in his ghostly guise what he had asserted regarding Saul while alive. In a word, Saul is doomed. This is not the message Saul wanted to hear. The prophet had already spoken. Why did Saul believe that Samuel might have a better message for him from the grave? Did Saul think that death might have induced Samuel to change his mind? God had already spoken via Samuel, the prophet, to Saul. Samuel's death did not alter that word of judgment from God. That thought is at least as frightening as a conversation with a dead prophet. It turns out that the difficulty with this passage has less to do with the ability of wizards or mediums than it does with the efficacy and certainty of a prophetic message of divine judgment. It's a sober text. Let me uh, remind you to go to my website, faspina.com and let me know what your email is so that I can contact you with uh, when we're ready for the mini que- courses. I'm sure you, you're very, very tired of hearing me say that. It is going to come, I promise. Uh, things are being done right now to make that happen. Uh, if you have any questions you want me to address in a future uh, Q&A uh, episode, then write me at uh, fspina106 at gmail.com. I want to thank you so very much for listening to The Bible You Thought You Knew. I have a question for you. Do you have a question or topic that you'd like me to cover on the podcast? If so, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do two simple things. One, 
Leave a rating and review telling me what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to the Bible. That's all you have to do. Then, listen in to hear your question answered on a future episode. Join us next time on The Bible You Thought You Knew when we discuss Jesus' personal Bible. God bless.